Okay, welcome back to the second half of week six lecture. First half was on the question of who rules. We looked at uh, pluralism, uh, elite theories, the debate between Robert Dahl and William Domhoff, and a larger question of the exercise of power and the way power is exercised in various ways. The faces of power, as we call them. Um, in the second half, what I'd like to do is touch on what we call theories of the state. And when we talk about the state, we're talking about government, um, not individual states as we describe them in the United States. Uh, before I get to that, I wanted to touch on a couple uh, books that were written that are quite uh, significant in terms of addressing some of the questions that we're talking about currently. and. The two books that I want to discuss um, in some ways make very different arguments. Uh, the first, and I think, you know, when I talk about written recently, maybe in the last five years, both of these books, the first by Mark Mizrucki. <clears throat> Mizrucki is a sociology professor at the University of Michigan, and he's written a lot on organizations and corporations and the relationship between them. And this particular book was interesting, I thought, and it uh, does make a contribution uh, to our understanding of what's been happening in the United States over the last uh, 50 to 60 years. We've talked about the rise of neoliberalism. And what um, Ms. Rucky argues, and there is a video clip uh, there's that photograph of his face. I'm not sure that is the pose he would like to be um, stuck on, uh, but that's simply the way <laughs> uh, it was um, preserved when I uh, did a cut and paste of the little video clip where he talks about his book. So it's worth checking that out. Just click on the photo of Miss Rucky, and uh, there's a brief description of what he uh, is trying to accomplish in this book. Now, what I found interesting about the book is the fact that he is offering what I would call a non-intuitive analysis of the current state of American politics. Because under neoliberalism, what we've had is the establishment, the concentration of enormous amounts of corporate power, almost to the exclusion of any kind of countervailing power, which we've talked about. We talk about countervailing power. Remember, the leading source of countervailing power is labor and labor unions, and we know that they're basically flat on their back and that the level of unionization and union organization and labor union membership is minimal in the United States, right? You would think that the what he calls the corporate elite would be a really tight, well-organized, powerful entity. Um, and to some extent, they're powerful uh, in spite of themselves. Uh, so what he argues is that under the current political economic environment in the United States, the corporate elite is actually very fractured. They're not well organized. And he thought that when they were well organized, when they had to be well organized, we actually had a more equitable kind of political economic arrangement. So what he does is he compares the past to the present. And he says, after World War II, and we've talked about this period, this period of the glory years of American capitalism, basically post-World War II, let's say 1945, 1947, to about the mid-1970s, uh, where there was some level, of some level of agreement over New Deal legislation, presumably, some level of moderation. Uh, we talked about the Capital Labor Accord, where there was some compromise between capital and labor. Labor was stronger. And there was a period of not only high levels of growth, but expansion of government programs and in uh, de declines in uh, income and wealth uh, inequality. Uh, so he's looking at the current situation in comparison to the past. Uh, so let me just touch on what he argues. And I'm hoping I'm hoping that I'm stimulating your interest in these things. 
uh, so that you may pursue them further. Uh, you can look up his book or his writings. Um, so he talks about corporate moderation or corporate pragmatism during this period I'm talking about, post-World War II to the mid-1970s. And he thought this was a period when business uh, as an entity, corporate, uh, the corporate elite as an entity uh, was more organized, was more responsible, uh, was willing to compromise, uh, spent time trying to develop ways to address uh, fundamental social issues and social problems uh, in the context of their own class interest, of course. Uh, but he viewed that as a unique period in American history, and he believes that today the corporate elite is largely fractured uh, and divided uh, because there's no reason to necessarily be strongly organized. So what were the uh, factors which contributed uh, to the sort of unity organized moderation, pragmatism of the corporate elite during the post-war period. And he talks about the relative uh, acceptance and legitimacy uh, of government, a role for government. Remember, neoliberalism comes in in the 80s. And basically, so I want you to think about each one of these in relationship to neoliberalism, right? So during this post-war period, uh, some level of acceptance of a governmental role in a Keynesian economic model by the corporate elite. Not necessarily embracing it, but some level of pragmatic acceptance, right? Secondly, and this is critical as far as I'm concerned, and for, for me, this is one of the most critical factors, there was during this period, as we know, a well-organized, relatively powerful labor movement. This represented a form of countervailing power. Business could not get every single thing they wanted because there was this organized counter force, countervailing power, labor, which forced corporations to organize themselves in order to bargain and negotiate and compromise with labor, okay? So under neoliberalism, Keynesian principles are totally thrown out the door. And this is not just a Reagan thing. This is also largely a Clinton thing. We know that labor unions have largely declined radically. And he also talks about the role of the financial community. And during this post-war period, when people thought about of financial institutions, and people who sat on the boards of financial institutions, they viewed this as a moderating force. Financial institutions were relatively conservative. The board members would meet in the way that um, William Domhoff talked about uh, consensus and cohesion among the elite. And it was a moderating influence. Now the financial sector has been totally transformed under neoliberalism. We have the financialization of the economy. We have commercial banks and investment banks engaged in the same kind of predatory activity, et cetera. So all of that is broken down. So his point is that during this post-war period, the corporate elite were more pragmatic, more moderate, more willing to compromise, more accepting of some level of social welfare, social, uh, uh, social welfare state expansion, all of these things break down uh, under neoliberalism. And what you have is an elite that simply gets what it wants. In other words, under neoliberalism, the whole ideology revolves around putting in place policies that are designed to do largely nothing but enhance the profit of the corporate sector under the assumption that we will all benefit from that. So if there is no countervailing force, there is no reason why corporate elite corporations, the corporate entity has to mobilize themselves and organize themselves in any significant way. They're largely getting everything they want under the neoliberal uh, ideology and political economic system. So that's basically Ms. Ruckey's uh, thesis. Um, here's the quote that I uh, select from Ms. Ruckey because I think it captures what he's getting at. He says, this is an elite that rather than leading, 
because he doesn't see them organizing themselves. Like there's something called the business roundtable. The business roundtable used to actually meet and develop policies to address the various problems and issues that the society was facing. It's true. We really have nothing like that uh, today as we did during the post-war period. So this is an elite that rather than leading has retreated into narrow self-interest. Narrow self-interest, by the way, um, encouraged by neoliberal ideology. It's individual elements increasingly able to get what they want in the form of favors from the state, the role of the state, but unable collectively to address any of the problems whose solution is necessary for their own survival. Now, there is a theory <clears throat> about the demise of capitalism, and the capitalists essentially dig their own graves. This was a phrase from Marx, right? So if the capitalists get everything they want, and they never have any countervailing push, they push themselves too far, and they ultimately destroy the very system that presumably uh, benefits them. So in his quote, he sort of hints at that, that dynamic, right? So that's Mizraki. That's his, his analysis. It's very, very interesting. Um, I would like to compare this with one of the most recent books written by Domhoff um, that I also, I read these two books around the same time and I found it very interesting because they were uh, making very different kinds of arguments. I thought, you know, if I was um, going to organize a uh, authors meet the critics, they have this at the American Sociological Association, the convention every year, what I would want to do is maybe set up a session where I bring Ms. Rucky in, I bring Domhoff in, and I'd say, tell us what you are arguing in your book, your books, okay? Ms. Rucky, you talk about your thesis. Domhoff, you talk about your thesis. And then debate, okay? Because what Domhoff says is that this notion of liberal ascendancy, right? And there's a whole literature on this in political sociology, this idea that during the post-war period, there was this notion of corporate liberalism, that corporations accepted uh, the uh, social welfare state, that they were at least, um, if not embracing, at least tolerant of the New Deal. Domhoff goes into excruciating detail. And if you like that kind of analysis, I would strongly recommend this book on all of the various Senate and congressional debates and hearings on policies uh, and legislation. And what he tries to show is, in fact, uh, this liberal ascendancy was a myth. So I'll just read this um, passage. And this is, I think, my way of describing what he um, writes in his book. He says, in spite of the New Deal legislation or what we have called, what we've called that capital labor accord that existed between post-World War II and the mid-1970s, the narrative that the 1930s to 1970s represented a period of liberal labor ascendancy is not supported by the evidence. So he kind of rejects that view, a view that is, I think, central to Ms. Ruckey's book. That indicates almost all legislation was marked by the moderate corporate class. Okay. And Ms. Rucky might say, well, the moderate corporate class is better than the reactionary corporate class that we have now. Um, but that class thwarted the expansion of labor rights. That's absolutely true, actually. The establishment of a social democratic welfare state. We never established that in the United States compared to European countries. The achievement of full employment which at one time was a goal uh, of economists in the United States during the post-war period, that we would have full employment, that every person who wanted to work would be provided a job. Significant income and wealth redistribution. Well, we know what's happened there. We have the highest level of income and wealth inequality since we've been keeping track of this stuff with good data and universal health care. <clears throat> These were things, by the way, that... I pointed out in an earlier lecture, uh, FDR in his Economic Bill of Rights uh, was proposing, and we have uh, really none of these things in place. Um, and it certainly they certainly weren't achieved during this period, 
there was a probably greater openness to them. But under neoliberalism, forget about it. None of these things stand a chance. Now, perhaps today, because there has been a reaction, and maybe we're in the late neoliberal period, some of these policy goals can be realized. We'll have to see. Okay, so I, I wanted to share these two books I had read recently. They directly um, address some of the issues related to the theory of the state, what the state is doing, <clears throat> and a historical analysis of the differences and changes over time um, from the presumably um, labor capital accord to the neoliberal present. <clears throat> Okay, so if you read the um, various articles, uh, one of the readings was a chapter taken, and you may have picked up on this. It's actually a chapter taken from a book by Grover uh, and Peshek that focuses on the presidency. Uh, but what they try to argue is that if you want to understand the presidency and why, uh, you know, uh, administrations, right, the administrations of various presidents do what they do, you need to take a structural approach, which is a very sociological way of understanding the world. And they argue that political science, when they talk about structural, they talk more about the way institutions work. Like structural means, well, you know, how does Congress work? What about the judicial branch? Or what about the executive branch? Uh, for Grover and Peshek, uh, they're talking about the larger political economic structure, right? And what they point out is that the constraints that exist on the president are largely political, economic, structural constraints. So hopefully you picked up on that. And there were some, they have some interesting observations uh, about the recent uh, dynamics um, among various presidencies. So there are basically three theories of the state uh, that sort of compete with each other. Some people have been able to um, meld them together. So I wouldn't say that they're necessarily mutually exclusive, but they tend to argue, um, they make an argument about the role of the state and why the state does what it does on a different basis, okay? All right. So the class dominance, uh, and this would be the Domhoff approach, which you should be familiar with now. Hopefully you read his, his article. It is known as the instrumental theory of the state. <clears throat> and some of this goes back to um, uh, some other writers. I'm thinking of uh, Ralph Miliband. Um, he's a British uh, uh, political scientist, political economist, uh, who wrote a book, um, The State and Capitalist Society, uh, he has two sons that actually uh, were quite uh, active in British politics. Um, Ralph, Militant, Ralph Miliband was a Marxist. His sons were, were not Marxist. Uh, they were Labor Party uh, people, but that's, there's a big difference between a Labor Party and uh, Marxism, at least, uh, during the Tony Blair era. <clears throat> in any case, I digress. So what is the instrumental theory? The instrumental theory is essentially that the state is an instrument that can be used to advance class interests. So the key is to capture the state, which uh, social class or which coalition or which you know, social formation uh, has the ability to organize and capture control of the state apparatus. And then the state apparatus is used to advance the interest of that particular group or that particular social class. Makes sense, right? So it's almost as if the state has a certain level of autonomy and there are theories about the autonomy of the state. And what the state does depends on what social class is able to organize and ultimately occupy the state, take control of the state and use the state, the governmental apparatus, as the instrument to advance their interests, okay? 
And that's essentially what Domhoff spends most of his time doing. He's showing that there's a ruling class. It's a capital society. It's a class society. There is a concentrated group of powerful corporate capitalists who, through the various methods and techniques we discussed in the first part of the lecture, are able to gain control of the state and, in turn, ensure that the state puts in place policies that advance its interests. All right? That's the instrumental theory. The alternative theory, and this is one which probably is more in line um, with the uh, authors on the presidency, is what we call the, <clears throat> what they call the capital dominance theory. It's also known as the structural theory. I originally associate this theory with Fred Block. Fred Block is a sociologist, an economic sociologist, whose work I follow closely. Um, I have enormous respect for Fred Block. He wrote a very nice, concise paper many years ago describing this structural uh, approach. And basically, the structural approach says, look, the state exists in the context of a capitalist economy. Okay, So we're talking about the state, the government, in a capitalist political economic system. The state has no choice. Let me just put it that way. Or it's, here's another way to put it, structurally constrained. Two, put in place policies that are in the interest of the capitalist class. Now, why does it, why does it have to do this? Why is, it, why is the state constrained? Why doesn't it have any choice? Well, the argument goes pretty much like this. Any administration or any government wants to preside in a capitalist society. We're taking that as given, okay? Any government wants to preside over a period of economic growth and economic expansion. In a capitalist economy, capitalist growth and economic expansion is based on the investment behavior of private capitalists. That's just a fact. This is one of the problems of capitalism. We depend on the behavior of the private capitalist class to drive the economy, to produce goods, to employ people. We've talked about this already, right? So the state has no choice if it wants to be presiding over a period of economic growth and economic expansion to put in place policies which create we use the term capacity to produce. You remember that? You have to put in place policies that ensure that there is a capacity to produce. A capacity to produce is just another way to think of a positive business climate. So the government has no choice. If they want to preside over an expanding economy where people have jobs, where there's economic growth, they have to put in place a favorable business climate. If they don't, let's suppose it's a socialist government and they say, we're going to put in place high taxes and regulations, et cetera, et cetera, right? You're going to have, and we talked about the supply side crisis, you're going to have a supply side crisis. Okay? You're going to have the capital strike. The capitalists are going to say, well, you know, the government is engaged in policies which are counter to our economic interest is a social class. Therefore, we are not going to invest because we don't anticipate the level of profit, the level of return on our investment that we demand or our shareholders demand. We will withdraw our investment. We will engage in a capital strike. <laughs> Economy goes down. The drain. How does that government recover from the economic downturn? It has to make policies that are agreeable to the capitalist class. Okay. Uh, there was a great example of this under the socialist government in France uh, when these were actually really socialist governments. Uh, many of these so-called socialist governments in Europe have become a very moderate, uh, just like the Democratic Party in the United States. Uh, but um, Francois Mitterrand was a, a socialist a very major political figure in France back in the 80s. And his party, 
uh, won the election and he was put in power um, in France. And he advocated raising taxes, uh, cutting the length of the work week, um, giving workers more power, uh, all of the things which socialists would propose. What happened? Okay. Well, he began to put these policies in place. The capitalist class in France responded. They began to disinvest. They began to shift their funds, their capital, their resources outside the country, putting them in locations, safe havens, where they could get a better return. The economy begins to slow down. It begins to go into recession. The people hurt most, this is the great tragedy and irony, the people who are hurt most by the socialist policies are the very working class people that socialism is supposed to benefit. Mitterrand sees he's losing support from his constituency, the working class, who are suffering from the consequences of his policies. Not the policies themselves, which are designed to help the working class, but the consequences of the policies in terms of the disinvestment and the recession and the unemployment. What does Mitterrand do? He totally reverses himself and begins to put in place pro-corporate, pro-business, pro-capitalist class policies. A socialist. You understand the point? Very powerful theory, okay? The state is constrained by the parameters of capital and capital investment. All right, so that's the capital dominance approach. Then there's something called the social struggle uh, approach. I think that's the term that was used um, in the reading. Uh, I sometimes call this a labor capital struggle approach of Bowles and Gintis. I'm going to talk more about Bowles and Gintis um, in a couple of weeks. Uh, Bowles and Gintis are two Marxist economists uh, who were at University of Massachusetts when I was there. Uh, they have gone on to do other things, write other kinds of papers and books. Uh, brilliant, brilliant economists. In any case, uh, they take a what I would call labor capital struggle approach, which uh, I'm very sympathetic to. <clears throat> and rather than uh, assuming one form of state or another, uh, they don't really necessarily um, subscribe to the instrumentalist approach. They don't necessarily assume that the state is always going to meet the needs of the capitalist class. They focus on the balance of power. Uh, the struggle between labor and capital and how that struggle at certain times benefits labor, at certain times benefits capital. They're not pluralists because they're basing their analysis on the struggle between labor and capital, the fundamental um, source of social change in a Marxist model, class struggle, class conflict. And so it's a more nuanced approach they wouldn't deny that the state is constrained in a capitalist society, uh, but they would say that there are times when labor is able to organize itself, labor is able to um, influence policy, and that those policies have significant positive consequences for workers. Now, it may turn out that the capitalist class responds to those in certain ways, and that has an impact on the economy, which in turn impacts state policy. But the point is, they're always focusing on labor, capital, the struggle, the relative strength between the two major, major social classes, as Marxists would. Okay. Um, we're going to say a little more about this model uh, when we address some other issues um, in a few weeks. All right, I do want to mention one book that had an enormous influence on me when I was uh, an undergraduate and a graduate student, and that was uh, James O'Connor's The Fiscal Crisis of the State. Uh, James O'Connor is a Marxist. 
And he had a certain approach to understanding why the state does what it does. And he used what might be called a functionalist uh, analysis. And functionalism is sometimes associated with uh, conservative uh, political social theory, like structural functionalism. Sociology students may know something about that. Uh, but there also are other forms of functionalism uh, as well. So <clears throat> what O'Connor argued was that the state has two, the state and the capitalist society has two fundamental functions. One is the accumulation function. All right. We've talked about this. This is creating a good business climate. And the government basically spends enormous amounts of money ensuring that there's an infrastructure in place that enhances the ability of corporations to make profit. They will cut taxes. They will provide subsidies, um, waivers, all kinds of ways to ensure that capitalists invest. So you can think of the accumulation function as a kind of capacity uh, to produce. The state has to ensure a capacity to produce in a capitalist society, and the state does this. The state does this using state revenues. Okay? And the reason I'm pointing that out is we're talking about a fiscal crisis, right? The state also, because on the one hand, the state is providing all of these benefits to ensure that the capitals can be profitable. That's the accumulation function. But they also have to ensure that the um, government, the political system is legitimate. Okay? Now, what do they mean by that? If the state is just putting in place policies, investments that are largely benefiting just the capitalist class, it doesn't look as if the state is representing the larger interest of the population. The state might have a legitimacy problem, you understand? Because it looks like the state is only catering to the needs of a small group. So O'Connor said there's also a legitimation function. The state has to also, and quite often this is necessary as a consequence of the way capitalism operates, that is producing economic deprivation, unemployment. The state also has to ensure its legitimacy by providing people who are negatively affected by capitalism, or who perceive that the state is only interested in helping capitalists by expanding the social welfare state, providing social insurance, providing social security, providing unemployment benefits, providing government assistance for people when they're suffering economically. So you have the accumulation function, you've got the legitimation function, you have the government spending money on both of these necessary functions. This is a functionalist analysis. This creates a fiscal crisis. What does he mean by a fiscal crisis? The state is constantly running budget deficits because it's trying to meet both of these functions. And you have a perpetual fiscal crisis <clears throat> of the state. And we can talk about this not just at the federal level, we can talk about this at the state level, we can talk about this at the city level. All government entities are facing this fiscal crisis because they have to meet the needs of these various um, accumulation function and legitimation function. And by the way, the accumulation function encourages low taxes. You don't want to raise taxes high because that undermines the accumulation fund. So the state is sort of in a bind. And the bind is essentially represented by the fiscal crisis, the budget deficits that governments face. Now, we're going to say more about fiscal policy and reasons why you might want to modify this analysis. But one thing I would say is that he was writing during a period, he was writing during this post-war period. This book was written in the early 1970s. He was describing that period that we just talked about, post-World War II to the mid-1970s. 
when there was some degree of acceptance by governments for Keynesian redistribution, taxation, uh, policies that would um, alleviate economic hardship, a role for government on the social welfare side. Once you get into neoliberalism, uh, this model doesn't really have much um, uh, application or validity. Because from my view, what neoliberalism has done is legitimacy has actually been subsumed under accumulation. In other words, you could think of this as kind of an ideological form of manipulation. Under neoliberalism, the ideology is essentially that the only thing that's legitimate is to ensure that the capitalist class has an environment that makes it profitable for them to invest their money. And if you put that in place, everything else falls into place in terms of trickle down, jobs, economic expansion, right? So the accumulation function becomes in and of itself the legitimation under neoliberalism. The only legitimate action of government is essentially to ensure that the private sector is able to be profitable, right? So legitimation function that he was talking about has largely been subsumed under accumulation. Now, one of the things that, um, one of the interesting things about this, one of the things that O'Connor talked about was he said, well, the other aspect of legitimation is that, you know, if people are having uh, difficulty economically under capitalism because you're promoting the accumulation function, the legitimation function is a way to ensure that um, you sort of cool them out, okay? You buy off their discontent. He did talk about the legitimation function that way. So you expand the welfare state as a way to ensure that people who are not profiting, benefiting from capitalism, at least they won't engage in radical political activity. You buy them off with an expansion of a social welfare benefits. Well, in our neoliberalism, we've wiped out the legitimation function. And neoliberalism is opposed to the expansion of the social welfare state, despite the fact that during this period, <clears throat> there's been enormous economic hardship. There's been enormous restructuring of the economy. Huge segments of American society particularly in states that had manufacturing, particularly in inner cities where there was manufacturing, particularly with brown and black populations that have been marginalized as a result of the restructuring of the economy under neoliberalism. What do we do if they are suffering economically on the one hand, but we're not providing them with government assistance on the other? How do we manage this potentially problematic population under neoliberalism, right? So the point I make here, it's the last item in this, uh, on this slide, because to some extent the legitimation function for O'Connor was a form of social control. You buy off the discontent of people by ensuring that they have access to some government assistance during hard time. You wipe that out under neoliberalism. Now, how are we going to socially control people? And this is where it gets interesting. What replaces the welfare state? The carceral state. And the sociologist that has done, has done the most remarkable analysis of this, tying all of these things together, the rise of neoliberalism, the change in policy, the rise in incarceration, the expansion of the carceral state is Louis Lequant. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Okay. So here's my point. You've got the accumulation legitimation function. If you 
eliminate the legitimation function under neoliberalism, how then do you socially control the population? You round them up. You lock them up. You criminalize poverty, which is essentially what's happened in the United States. I want to read this quote from Waquan because it is so powerful rhetorically. Indeed, the generalized hardening of police, judicial and correctional policies that can be observed in most of the countries of the first world over the past two decades, talking about neoliberalism, partake of a triple transformation of the state. Talking about the state, which it helps simultaneously to accelerate and obfuscate, wetting the amputation of the economic arm, this is powerful met metaphorical language, that is economic intervention of the state to manage the economy. You amputate the economic arm, you retract its social bosom, that is the social welfare provisions, and you have the massive expansion of its penal fist. I wish I had written that. I really wish I had written that. What does that mean? Is it a coincidence <clears throat> that with the introduction of neoliberalism, neoliberal economic policies, restructuring of the economy, deindustrialization, all of those things we've talked about, is it surprising? Is it a coincidence that around that time you would also have this massive, massive increase? And most of you, if you're a social science student, sociology student, you know about this incarceration. Um, surge began in 1980. So the way we have managed the economic deprivation, the marginalization, is not through the social welfare state. It's through the carceral state. People engage in activities for survival. They're on the street. They're involved in, you know, dealing drugs, selling drugs, whatever it is. You also have at this time, coincidentally, the war on drugs, the expansion of the criminal justice system, in ways that has been, have been discussed when we talk about Clinton, Biden, see the sharp increase. Okay. Notice when it happened, 1980. Okay. So there is a correlation between neoliberalism and the rise of the carceral state as a result of the consequences of neoliberal policy. Uh, this is a slide I show in my introduction to sociology class. I introduced this to them as well. <clears throat> I basically asked them, you know, what happened in 1980? How do we understand this sharp, sharp rise in the proportion of the population that's incarcerated? We incarcerate more people in the United States as a percentage of the population, as a total raw number than any other country in the world. What does that say about the United States? This is how we manage marginalization, economic insecurity. So I say post-1980 neoliberal economic reform, increased economic insecurity, marginalized large segments of the population, disproportionately black and brown. Instead of the right to welfare, and this is the language that Waquan uses, there is the obligation of workfare. He says from welfare to workfare. That was under George, um, Bill Clinton. Rather than the safety net, the drag net. Instead of the social protection state, the carceral state. And the various coping strategies of the poor are criminalized, vagrancy, homelessness, rounding people up. They get caught up in the dragnet of the criminal justice system. They never leave. 
So punishing the poor, the criminalization, the poverty, there's a massive literature on this. Think about all this in relationship to the role of the state. All right, so the other point that Laquan makes, you know, just give a few little illustrations here in the contemporary setting of the Trump administration. You have the regulation of the poor, the over-hyper-regulation of the poor, on the one hand, under neoliberalism, and you have the deregulation of the rich, of the wealthy, of the corporate elite, of the capitalist class. Right? So when Trump was running in 2016, and by the way, this has been further advanced as a campaign strategy now in 2020. He embraces law and order. This is an old strategy, goes back to Richard Nixon. It worked well. And when people heard law and order, it was a dog whistle. It meant clamping down on black and brown populations in urban areas primarily. That's what people thought when they heard law and order brought back by Trump. Jeff Sessions, who's no longer there, of course, with the Trump administration, again, prioritizes law and order above civil rights. Hearing the same thing today. Okay? This is a campaign strategy. Department of Justice scales back programs to reform police departments because they want the police departments to be able to enforce law and order. So you've got regulating those at the bottom and you deregulate those at the top. This is one of the ways to think about the role of the state under neoliberalism. These are headlines. These are not headlines from, you know, the Socialist Workers Party newspaper. <laughs> These are headlines from mainstream media. The Trump administration is a golden age for corporate crooks. Deregulation nation. Congress wants to let corporations take charge. Embattled bankers embrace Trump's call for deregulation. Profit is not a four-letter word. I never thought it was. President Trump's deregulation agenda clashes with the cure for the opioid epidemic. So this was a deepening under Trump of the neoliberal approach. Regulate those at the bottom, hyper-regulate them through law and order, through the expansion of the police. Now, a lot's happened since 2016, and we've had the Black Lives Movement. But the protest of the Black Lives Movement is now being used as the reason why we need to have more law enforcement, more law and order. And I posted something this week in a discussion area. I selected, if it's okay, I selected an article, I hope you don't mind, uh, about DeSantis talking about legislation to ensure that there is no disorder when protesters are engaging in their constitutional right to protest. Right? So this is becoming a strategy both nationally and at the very state levels, and I'm sure it will be in cities as well. Okay, so that's all I have to say about theories of the state. Hopefully you have a little understanding of the different approaches people take. And I wanted to finish within, you know, so you have a clear understanding of the nature of the neoliberal state with regard to this regula hyper-regulation of the bottom deregulation of the top. This has been going on for a long time, just gets accelerated uh, under the extreme reactionary neoliberal uh, regime of Trump. Trump does pay lip service to the working class in ways that generate support uh, for his policies. And of course, there's the social and cultural issues as well, which we've talked about. Okay, that concludes my lecture. Thanks for listening. And I will be back next week for another topic.